Maybe nobody has been further out in front, more in the vanguard of evangelism and revival to many of us. And our next speaker, not a few of our churches have enjoyed incredible harvest. The instrument, the individual that God has used to help many of us reap literally hundreds of souls has been Brother Jack Cunningham when he has spoken faith into the hearts of our people and confidence into what the congregations that we pastor. And so it's no mistake, it's no aberration that we bring to the pulpit of Because of the Times 2004, a man who is comfortable in the context of revival. And I ask you to receive him into this sacred desk and to respond to whatever word the Holy Spirit will speak to us through this very, very anointed vessel of God. May God bless him as he comes and you receive him now in Jesus' name. Everybody clap your hands to the Lord, will you? All over this house, let's lift up our voice. Let's give praise and honor to Him. Father, we magnify You today. Above everything else, before everything else, beside everything else, we give You praise. We praise and honor and extol You today. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank You, Jesus. My, what a rich time we are having. Last night, Brother Anthony Mangan, so greatly used of God. If I would have got on a plane and went home today, I would have had to have said it was already the best because of the times that I had ever attended. What a powerful, deep move of the Holy Ghost we enjoyed last night. Thank you, Brother Mangan, for letting God use you, and thank you that it's more than just words and all of us need to understand brother Mangan doesn't just say he loves souls he doesn't just say he supports missions this church Pentecostals of Alexandria is the number one giving church to missions in the entire United Pentecostal Church International add up what they give to every program and they give more than any other church in our fellowship I think we ought to give them a great hand of appreciation Thank you. <clears throat> Brother Mitchell, thank you for that message this morning. Thank you, Sister Mangan, for stirring us again, as only you can do. I love this precious lady. I give honor to my general superintendent, who I believe is God's man for the hour. No hesitation, no question. I'm absolutely convinced he's God's choice to lead this church where God wants this church to get to. I give honor to all those that are on the platform. You may be seated. It takes only a few minutes to determine what matters most to a person. A short conversation with most anyone will reveal the things they love and the things that they are most passionate about. People talk about the things that are important to them. And so it was with the Lord Jesus Christ. He talked about lost sheep and a lost coin. He talked about a lost prodigal son and the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He explained why he eat with sinners. And he argued that they that are whole needeth not a physician, but they that are sick. He declared His purpose to be the seeking and the saving of lost humanity. He spoke of healing the brokenhearted, preaching deliverance to captives, recovering the sight of the blind, and setting at liberty them that are bruised. If our paths would have crossed recently and you and I would have had opportunity to talk, you probably would think that all I care about right now is raising funds and balancing budgets and managing staff change. It has been a very busy time for me recently. And if I'm not careful like you, we can become overwhelmed in the mechanics of ministry and we can get mired in the, in the busyness of executing our 
our duties even to the point that we become oblivious to the purpose and the passion of the church. So many things, things that I promise you I feel at least at the time are important in my life and require my time. When I answer mail in my office, it takes hours. I get hundreds of emails every week. It seems like my phone never stops ringing. I have a staff of 16 people to manage. I have 480 plus home missionaries and 352 daughter congregations to help along the way. We're working with 53 languages and 69 cultures. We're in 26 approved metro cities and we have 36 metro missionaries on site. We've got 1,066 One Grand Vision commitments we're trying to turn into 1,066 churches this year. We have 27 ministries, deaf and acts and prison and Bibles and church growth and on and on it goes. Our Division sponsors 25 conferences and seminars a year. I'm superintendent of two small districts. When you're in St. Louis, one of them's a thousand miles one way, and the other one's 2,500 miles the other way. Uh, we have a fiscal responsibility this year of more than four and a half million dollars. I sat on the planning committee, the administrative committee, the home missions board, the board of directors, the executive board, the general board, the Trans Canada Board. And friend, I'm coming to tell you today that it is easy to get all wrapped up in the mechanics of what we feel is important and forget about the real passion and the real purpose of an apostolic church. Can somebody say amen? Amen. It is true. Sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. It would be easy to give in to the weightiness of the myriad of responsibilities that you and I have to shoulder. But we've got to remind ourselves often. I said we've got to remind ourselves often that none of these things represent the purpose of the church. None of these things represent the passion of the church. The church is about souls. The church is about reaching the world. The church is about affecting the lives of lost men and women. Somebody clap your hands and say amen. We expend our time and energy on things that are of no eternal value at all. Can I tell you today, preacher friend, that the church is not in the computer business. The church is not in the building business. The church is not in the pew and the carpet business. The church is not in the bus and van business. The church is not in the fundraising business or the music business or the fellowship business. Brother Haney, we're not even in the organization business. i got to tell somebody today that the business of the church is souls. I said the business of the church is souls. I know you believe in the rapture of the church. I know you believe that the trumpet's going to sound. And I know that you believe that it couldn't be long now until that great event takes place. But can I tell you that when the trumpet sounds, this beautiful building we're in today isn't going up in the rapture. That padded pew you're sitting on, that great keyboard and that organ and this PA system and all of our high-tech toys, none of it's going up in the rapture. If you want your life to count if you want the time that you spend to have eternal value attached to it then you're going to have to invest your time in souls somebody say hallelujah 
I watched as Brother Mangan paraded in what looked like about 150 street kids last night and they stood all over this platform and I sat there and thought to myself I'd rather stand on the judgment day with about 30 or 40 street kids behind me I'd rather stand on judgment day before God with a busload of sinners standing behind me and say God this is where I invested my time God this is what was most important to me In Matthew 16 and 26, Jesus asked the question, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? With that one short piercing question, Jesus Christ reveals to us the worth of a single soul. To God, one soul is worth more than all of this world. Stack up on the one side of the balance the combined wealth of the world. All of the gold, silver, all of, the, all of its jewels and its precious stones. Stack up its most magnificent homes, its luxury automobiles, its yachts, and its airplanes. And on the other side of that balance, place just one single soul. And in God's economy, that one soul is going to tip the scale every time. Because one soul matters more to God than all the world somebody shout hallelujah Hallelujah. come to tell you today it doesn't matter to God if that soul is a black man a Hispanic man an Asian man or a white man It doesn't matter to God if that soul's rich or poor, educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter to God if that soul's a somebody or by society's standards a nobody. One soul, any soul, matters more to God than all of this world. Church has been tight many ways. It's been typed as the old ship of Zion, an ark of safety. It's been typed as a lighthouse, a city of refuge, the bride of Christ, and more. But I believe in the year 2004, it would be more accurate to type the church as a spiritual hospital, a spiritual healing center for the helpless and the hopeless of this generation. If they don't find hope here, if they don't find help here, here. You're going to have to forgive my narrow mindedness, but there isn't anywhere else to find it than among people who have the truth. When I pastored in Virginia, one of the things I hated most was visiting hospitals. I did not like to go to the hospital. I spent about six weeks in the hospital when I was a kid. And I I, I guess that just did something to my mind about hospitals. I just don't like it. But I've been there as a dutiful pastor. I've been there at five in the morning before a precious saint went to surgery. I've been there in the middle of the night, the middle of the day, the evening, the afternoon, you name it. I've been there. And there's one thing I found out about going to hospitals. It doesn't matter what time of day or night you go to a hospital, you're going to catch them cleaning the place up. They're disinfecting it. They're sanitizing it. They're doing what Whatever they can do to get rid of the germs and get that place all clean and neat and they want it to look right they want it to smell right they want all the beds to be clean and white they want all the utensils to be sanitized and disinfected and they cover them up and seal them to keep the germs off of them it's a 24 hour a day 7 day a week effort can I pause in my message and tell you that I believe God's church ought to be a clean church can I tell you that I believe come ye out from among them be ye holy saith the Lord and touch not the unclean thing I still believe holiness without which no man shall see the Lord I still believe be ye holy as I am holy saith God 
I believe this Acts 2.38 message from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I believe in separation with all of my heart. Don't you ever let anybody steal our uniqueness from us. It's our uniqueness that protects us from the rest of the pack and from becoming generic and melting in with the charismatic world. We need to stand and be who we're supposed to be. But let me tell this great group of preachers and preachers' wives and families something today. If there's an automobile accident out here in MacArthur and a fellow gets thrown through the windshield and it cuts that main artery in his neck and every time his heart beats, it spurts blood out three feet and they call the ambulance, the paramedics come. They try to stop the bleeding and they can't. They call the hospital emergency room and say we're on our way with a leader he's making a mess he's bled all over the ambulance he's bled all over the gurneys he's bled all over us we're bringing in a mess what if when that ambulance come roaring up to the door of the emergency room they were met by a line of doctors and nurses and said no way we just got this place cleaned up That isn't how it works, honey. They understand that though they've got to have a clean house, they've got a purpose that exceeds everything else. They swing those doors wide open. Bring him on in here. He can mess up the instruments. He can bleed on the floor and the wall. He can get it all over our smocks and the new bed and the new pillowcase. It don't matter because our job is to help them that can't help themselves. You may be seated. This church was designed for whosoever will. I said this church was designed for whosoever will. An apostolic church cannot. In fact, an apostolic church must not base its philosophy of ministry on racial prejudice and society, societal and cultural biases and regional fears. I'm not running for anything ever again in my life. So I'm just going to be honest with you right now. It's a hypocrite church. It's a hypocrite preacher. It's a hypocrite member that sends money to Africa to reach a black man, but won't walk down the street and knock on the door of a black man. One of the things that makes this a great church, and I've had the opportunity to preach here on many different occasions, and this is one of the greatest that there is. But when you come in here on a Sunday, you're going to see a black man and a Spanish man and a white man sitting on the same pew, worshiping the same God. Honey, that's the will of God. I said, that's the will of God. God loves souls more than He loves anything else. I got news for you. If you're not reaching into the ethnic community, you are missing one of the greatest revival opportunities of all time. I had a preacher tell me, Brother Cunningham, if I let black people come to my church, the KKK will burn the building down. I told him, why don't you get one up on the devil? Ensure that building real good. Do what God told you to do. And then build one back twice as big. You 
See, we don't have a right to determine who gets to hear the gospel and who don't. If we believe what we're preaching, if we believe we have the only message, does anybody here believe that? If we believe that we have all the truth, if we believe that we are in fact possessors of truth, we may well be the biggest sinner standing before God on judgment day when we try to explain to Him why we had in our hand what we did and didn't share it with every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this earth. Where's Brother Mangus at? Brother Mangus, stand up back here, my buddy. I prayed him through the Holy Ghost a long time ago from my grandpa's church in Parkersburg, West Virginia, now pastors in St. Louis, Missouri, and he's a soul winning pastor. Everybody said a soul winning pastor. He came in from teaching a Bible study one night. His little girl ran across the room and put her arms around his neck and had no more embraced her daddy than stood back and said, Daddy, you smell bad. Said, Daddy, you smell like cigarettes and you smell like wine and beer. And he had to set his little girl down and explain that he just taught a Bible study around a kitchen table where the cigarette smoke was so thick that he had to use the chart to wave it out away from the, from, from the pages so they could see it and everybody there was drinking beer and drinking wine and even offered him some while he's teaching them a Bible study he looked at his little girl and said baby you know what that is you smell that's the sin of sinners Now you can sit there and look at me if you want to, but I'm going to tell you something today. The United Pentecostal Church needs the scent of sinners on it. I preached in a church where they'd had over 200 people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in a short period of time. And when I walked into the vestibule, they had a sign up said, please don't smoke in the vestibule. I went in the men's bathroom. They got a sign up says, no smoking in here. And when the pastor saw me looking at him, he, he very timidly and bashfully and, and I guess worried about, about me being from World Evangelism Center and maybe us getting the wrong idea about him. But he said, Brother Cunningham, I, I'm real sorry, but we had to put those signs up. We got so many new converts around here and we've had so many new sinners visiting the services that we had to put up signs telling folks you're not allowed to smoke in here. We need the sin of sinners on us. I'm so tired of this us four and no more mentality. I'm so tired of the complacency. I'm so tired of Laodicea. I'm so tired of us being content with where we are and what we've got. we got a world that's lost and dying and on its way to hell. There's not a district in our fellowship. There's not a church in our fellowship that has a reason to lift their head and say we've done all we can do and we can sit back and rest. No, we can't give up. We've got to keep going. Holy Ghost smote my heart. I went to get a haircut. My barber in St. Louis, it's very rare that I can get a haircut at the same place twice. I know I need one now. Don't look too close. But when I get a chance to go to my barber in St. Louis, it's a treat. I've had my haircut in some of the most horrible places you can imagine on earth. Brother Kelly and Sister Kelly, I went and got one in Scotland when I was there. And the guy got to talking about Margaret Thatcher and I thought he liked her and talked, found out he hated her guts. But the more I talked about her, the more he cut. I called my barber said, can you get me in? They said, yeah, come this afternoon. 
went to the barber shop so so happy and pleased I was going to get a good haircut from a barber I trust and when it came time for my appointment the, the receptionist come out and said Mr. Cunningham I'm, I'm sorry but your barber had to leave on an emergency he's not here today but, but Julie can cut your hair if you want her to and I thought well I'm here I need a haircut Julie will be just fine about two minutes later a girl stepped around the petition she had hair that was sticking straight up in spikes some of it was purple some of it was blue some of it was yellow some of it was orange that girl must have had a hundred piercings in her face all around her ears her lips her nose I mean in, in the sides of her eyes she was all pierced up and under the piercing was all kind of painting she had on polka dot pants and a plaid shirt she had on two different color socks and her shoes didn't match She said, I'm Julie. Are you Jack? <laughs> if it wasn't for wanting to please God, I'd have said, no ma'am. Jack said, tell you he had to leave. And I thought, well, I'll just endure it. And I went and sat down, and I did like I do too often. I thought, I'll just go to sleep. I'll just sit down here and close my eyes and rest while this girl cuts my hair, and I hope she hurries up. There couldn't be anything in the world her and I would have in common. There couldn't be anything on earth she and I'd want to talk about. She wouldn't want to hear anything I got to say. I certainly don't want to hear anything she's got to say. I apologize, but that's what was going through my mind. While she's cutting my hair, she said, where do you work? So, well, I, I work over here at the World Evangelism Center. Go to the end of I-70 and right where it butts into 270, that big building right there. And she said, oh yeah, I was there the other day. I said, you were at World Evangelism Center the other day. She said, yeah, you have a bookstore in there, don't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, my mama is a cocaine addict. My uncle is a hopeless cocaine addict. She said, somebody gave my mama one of those videos on Left Behind. And, and, and she said, we all sit down in the living room and watched it. And she said, I don't know nothing about God. And I don't know nothing about the church. And I don't know nothing about the Bible. But she said, when I was finished watching it, I knew I didn't want to go to hell. She said, I went to your bookstore and bought a Bible. She said, I don't know how else to find out anything about God. She said, I just bought a Bible and I'm going to start reading it through. She said, I've had it two days now. I've already read. And she named some books that she had been reading from. But she said, I really don't understand anything about it. And when I looked in the mirror, tears are streaming down her face. The other people that are cutting hair have quit cutting hair. And now they're listening to her talk. And some of them got tears in their eyes. And when I got up out of that chair, I said, Julie, I want to apologize to you for not telling you about Jesus. I said, but if you'll stay here, I'm going to go to my office and get a Bible study. And me and you is going to sit out there on that park bench. And I'm going to give you a Bible study and help you know about Jesus. We don't have a right to determine who can hear and who can't. This conference is about passion and purpose. I ask you, what is the purpose of the church? What is the passion of this church? What is our right to existence as a church? Why do we send home and foreign missionaries? Why do we build buildings? I'll tell you why. It's to evangelize a lost and dying world that's on its way to a devil's hell. And that is our only right to existence. It is our passion and it is our purpose. I 
I believe that evangelism should be the central focus of everything we do and everything we are as a church. You may not agree with me, Pastor, but I'm going to give you my opinion. Every fellowship, every function, every program, every project, every service, every meeting we have ought to be about reaching lost souls. We've been entertaining each other too long. We've been entertaining the saints of God too long. We need to refocus what we're doing. We need to refocus on the purpose of the church. And that's winning lost people. See, evangelism is not an option to an apostolic church. Evangelism isn't something that you can choose to do or not do. Evangelism is not a phase that the church goes through. It isn't something you can schedule on your one, your three, your five year plan. And then when you've done a little evangelism, go off and do something else. Brother Tenney, I love this man so dearly. He wrote a book entitled, The Main Thing is to Let the Main Thing Be the Main Thing. And I ask you, Pentecostals today, what is the main thing? What is the main thing? In Luke 19 and 10, Jesus revealed to us His purpose and passion. He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the main thing with Him. Oh, you didn't hear me. That was the main thing with Him. Seeking and saving lost humanity. If we are the body of Christ in the earth, then doesn't it make sense that the purpose and the passion of Christ must become the purpose and the passion of this church? Those who love lost souls, those who pray for the lost, and those who reach the lost, in my opinion, are the most important people among us. Hello? Those who love the lost are, the, are more important to the kingdom of God than any of us who, who know how to preach a little bit. Those that love the lost and can reach the lost are more important than those of us that can sing. They're most, more important than those of us who can play. They're more important than those of us who hold some lofty position within the church. There's nothing more important in any church than a soul winner. I'll reveal something to you. I may, may not, might, might not, should have done that. Brother Williams, Brother Keys, and other members, Brother Lumpkin, members of our home mission boards here, we have an application for Christmas for Christ. People that want to go start a new church, and it's about 10 or 12 pages and 80 or 90 questions on it. And, and when we go through those applications, there's a stack of them, yay high, and it takes our board several days to go through them. And, and, and these men will tell you that of all the questions that are on there, almost every man on our board, when they're handed a new application, they flip over to about number 64. It says, How many souls have you won outside the pulpit in the last two years? Because we know that anybody that can win souls can build a church. And if you're not a soul winner, we're not going to invest God's money in you because you're not going to build a church. I don't care how you can preach. I don't care how many instruments you can play. I don't care how well you sing. I don't even care if you got all nine gifts of the Spirit. If you don't love lost people, you will not build a church. Sister Joan Ewing, sitting over here on the side, one of the best friends Home Missions has ever had for the last several years, co coordinates our Home mission service at General Conference. And we were in board meetings last year, year before last, and, and uh, had all the 95 members of our Home Missions Board of Directors there. And I'm, I'm leading the meeting, and I saw Brother and Sister Ewing walk 
down the hallway past our doors and I sent one of the men said go go grab sister Ewing and bring her in here and and tell her I want her to say something about our home mission service I really I really wanted her to come in and tell us who's going to follow who and who's going to sing and how long each is going to take and what they're going to do and kind of tell the men where they need to gather and when they ought to come up on you know what I'm talking about I wanted her to go through that stuff and sister Ewing walked down the the side aisle of that of that boardroom and walked up on the podium and and when she stepped to the podium she looked at that group of men and said you are only free from your responsibility to reach the lost when you meet a man or a woman for whom Christ did not die and turned around and walked back out of the room you are only free from your responsibility to reach the lost when you meet a man or a woman for whom Christ did not die. Say, God, help us. One of the greatest revivals taking place in North America today is behind the prison doors and behind prison walls, behind the barbed wire and behind the bars and in the cells where men and women are, are, are incarcerated. They cannot help themselves. They are helpless and most of them hopeless and they've made messes out of their lives. But God has given us a great revival there. Charlie Mahaney called me yesterday and I, I asked him, Charlie, can I use this tomorrow? He reported to me just yesterday that Sister Mahaney and her team of ladies who go into the ladies' prisons in Little Rock, in and around Little Rock, Arkansas, have baptized 3,400 women in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ behind the bars. He reported to me that in San Bernardino, California, more than 3,000 have been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost in prisons. Our Texas District Prison Coordinator, Donald Grigsby, I believe is here, but he reports that more than 3,000 have been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost in Texas prisons and jails. Honey, that's a 9,400 soul revival that has taken place in the prisons. In August of this year, we're going to have a prison blitz. We have seven major prisons that have allowed us to come in. We're going to be there exclusively. There'll be nobody else there but us. The largest of those prisons is in Mississippi. They have 30,000 inmates. They're going to lock the prison down for five days. They do it every year in the month of August. It's a lockdown where the men stay in their cells for five days without coming out. But during those five days, they're going to let us bring in all the United Pentecostal church people we can round up there's no limit on it and we're going to get a carry a chair and a Bible study and sit there and talk to men behind prison doors for five days during the lockdown At the end of the lockdown, they're going to let us have a two-night crusade. Brother Charlie Mahaney's going to preach it. And don't you know, after those men have been locked up for five days, we're probably going to have all 30,000 of them out there in the prison yard. And there's no telling what God's going to do. I'm closing. I ask you this question, can we content ourselves with what we've done for God while others who don't have the truth that we proclaim are making great strides in the propagation of their doctrines? The Jehovah Witnesses log 267 million hours of witnessing annually. Their annual printing stacks up 450 times higher than the Empire State Building. Over 30,000 of their young people volunteer annually to knock doors all over this country. Sister Tenney, you gave me a... You gave me a, a little story, a true story years ago. I just found it last week. I'm going to read it. Indulge me while I read, please. I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust, it says. I considered myself a Christian. I attended church service since I was a small boy. We had heard the stories 
of what was happening to the Jews, but like most people today in this country, we tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really taking place. A railroad track ran behind our small church and each Sunday morning we would hear the whistle from a distance and then the clacking of the wheels moving over the track. We became disturbed when one Sunday we noticed cries coming from the train as it passed by. We grimly realized that the train was carrying Jews to certain death in the death camps. These poor people were crammed in those cars like cattle on their way to slaughter. Week after week the train whistle would blow. We would dread to hear the sound of those old wheels because we knew that the Jews would begin to cry out to us as they passed our church. It was so terribly disturbing but we could do nothing to help these poor miserable people yet their screams tormented us. We knew exactly what time that whistle would blow and we decided that the only way to keep from being so disturbed by the cries was to start singing our our hymns and by the time that train come rumbling past the churchyard we were singing at the top of our voices and if some of the screams reached our ears well then we would just sing a little louder until we could hear them no more United Pentecostal Church because of the times 2004 I believe is a crossroad for us as a fellowship I know we have other friends here that are from other organizations. Thank you for being here. But let me talk to my brethren today. I'm telling you, we are at a crossroads. You heard it last night. You heard it twice already this morning. God's wanting us to get off a dead center. God's wanting us to refocus ourselves. God is wanting this church to come alive with a brand new burden and a brand new zeal for reaching the world. And can I tell you this afternoon, that God is not going to send us to do anything that He's not going to also help us accomplish it. But I'm afraid, I'm afraid that some of us, we have become so content with where we are, with what we've done, with the things we've accumulated with the position and the place we hold, with the size of our congregation, with the amount of tithing and offering that comes in every week. Something needs to shake us to the core of our soul. Something needs to get us out of the rut that we're in. Something needs to move me and you to a place where we hear again the screams of the lost and the dying on their way to a devil's hell. A young man I love so dearly, he calls me his mentor. Came to me at General Conference, said, Oh, Brother Cunningham, we had the greatest service we've ever had last Sunday. I said, Oh, man, that's wonderful. How many new people repented? He said, Well, you know, it wasn't one of those kind of services. He said, But, man, the choir's never sung better. I'm telling you, they were awesome. I said, Well, how many people were baptized? He said, Well, Brother Cunningham, it, it, you know, nobody got baptized, but oh, the whole choir filed off the platform. And, and, and they did a Jericho march, and we shouted all over the building. And I said, Well, how many people got the Holy Ghost? And he said, Well, he, Brother Cunningham, it just wasn't that kind of service, but we got in circles and we prayed one another through, and, and we made sure sure everybody was dancing and having a good time I've got news for you United Pentecostal Church what you and I call our best service and what God calls our best service is two different things I got Bible for that statement. You know, there's only three places in the Bible that tells us heaven rejoices. The book of Job tells us that the morning stars rejoiced at creation. The Bible said an angelic host rejoiced at the birth of the Christ child. And the Scripture tells us that heaven rejoices when one single sinner repents. 
you want to have heaven come down while you're having church? Do you want heaven's blessings on your congregation and upon your services? It's not in the shout of the choir. It's not in the polemics in the pulpit. It's not in your building or your pews or your money and your high-tech toys. Honey, it's in heaven's sinners! In your altar! That's what gets heaven's attention! Stand with me, will you? You'll have to forgive me. I'm a mathematician. I love math. I love numbers. I'm always thinking about numbers. But I asked myself the other day, what would happen in the United Pentecostal Church if just the churches that are represented in this conference, probably about 1,500 congregations, pastors represented here, 12, 1,500 pastors, if every one of you would go home and just have one person a month get the Holy Ghost, we'd have an 18,000 soul revival this year in North America. Just one a month. If every one of you would go home and have one a week get the Holy Ghost, we'd have an 80,000 soul revival this year. Not in Ethiopia, right here in North America. And in six years, Brother Haney, we had doubled the membership of the United Pentecostal Church. Just one person a week. There isn't a church in this place, not a home missionary here, that couldn't have one a month, one a week, get the Holy Ghost this year. But before that's going to happen, you can do all the math, throw out all the challenges, but the first thing's got to happen. It's got to start inside your own heart. You've got to want, you've got to love, you've got to reach for lost people. Take the hand of the person beside you. Brother Mangan, I don't know that I have ever felt the Holy Ghost and because of the times like I felt it last night and today. God's here right now. He's not speaking to one of us. He's speaking to all of us. Don't you wait on somebody else to hear from God. You hear from God right now. God, I recognize that you're speaking to the church. Somebody needs to tell him, God, I hear what you're saying. Nothing matters more to God than souls. Nothing matters more to God than souls. Do you hear me? Nothing matters more to God than souls. I want you to turn now and lay your hand brother to a brother. Brother, don't lay hands on your wife. Wife, don't lay hands on your husband. Brother, find a brother. Sister, find a sister. And I don't want you to patty cake pray. I want you to lay your hand right in the middle of their forehead. I want you to turn and lay your hand on them. And I want you to pray, God, remove everything that's hindering us from having the revival that you want us to have. Remove everything from our life and from our affections that keeps us from being what you want us to be come on pray in the Holy Ghost take spiritual authority That's it. That's it. That's it. 
Come on, this isn't no time to patty cake play. I want you to pray with fervency. Pray with power. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. You can't put a limit on what God wants to do among us. There are no bounds to what God wants to do among us. God help us to get self out of the way. Oh God, we want your purpose to be our purpose. We want your passion to be our passion. Everybody in this building, raise both of your hands to heaven and don't say a word of English. Let the Spirit begin to pray through you. Raise both of your hands to heaven. God, we are yielding, we are submitting ourselves right now to you. I hear a different sound. I hear a different sound. The sound of the Holy Ghost is taking over. It's taking over. Don't stop. Don't stop. We're going to make His passion our passion. We're going to make His purpose our purpose. Every general board member in this building, would you step out of where you are and come to the platform quickly? Brother Mangan wants every general board member, please come quickly. Every general board member, church, raise your hands again. Talk in tongues. Let the Spirit of the living God baptize your spirit again. Come on, come on, don't get tired of this. Pastor and senior pastor and full time evangelist. Get out in the aisle and move towards the front. In the balcony, go to the rail. My voice is gone. Every general board member, please, on the platform. Brother Mangan wants every senior pastor and every pastor in the building to go to the aisles, if you would, please. Step out of where you are and stand in the aisle and come as close as you can to the front. Every pastor, every senior pastor, if you're in the balcony, come as close to that rail as you can get. Step out of where you are and come to the rail. All over this floor, senior pastor and pastors, get out in the aisles. Come to the front I'm telling you the Holy Ghost is in this house every full time evangelist every missionary come on every metro missionary get out in the aisle come as close as you can to the front Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody raise your hands and invite the Holy Ghost to have its way. Would you do that? Come on. God, we want to move everything else out of the way. We want you to have your way. Now, general board members, would you turn and lay hands on one another? Come on, general board, our district superintendents, that we're going to take it back to our districts. Now, pastors, there's nothing but pastors, missionaries, 
and full-time evangelists in the aisles turn around to that pastor and pastor to pastor and missionary to missionary. Let's lay hands afresh and new again on one another. Come on in the balcony. Lay hands on one another. Come on, general board. Come on, executive board. Cast vision for these districts, oh God. Let every district have a revival. There's a new sound in this building right now. We're going to go on, but not right now. We're going to stop and pause what the Holy Ghost wants to do right now. Oh, Spirit! You're going to give us souls. We're going home to turn our churches upside down for soul winning. We're going to get back to your passion and your purpose. Oh God. This is a move of God and we're in no hurry right now. We can't get in a hurry right here. The Holy Ghost is speaking to us. We can't be fast right now. God is saying a word, Brother Johnson. Lord, we're going to try. We're going to give it everything we got, God. We're committed to that. We're going to give it to everything we got. <laughs> 